Welcome to Decision Vision, a podcast series focusing on critical business decisions. Brought to you by Brady Ware and Company. Brady Ware is a regional, full-service accounting and advisory firm that helps businesses and entrepreneurs make visions a reality. And welcome back to Decision Vision, a podcast giving you, the listener, clear vision to make great decisions. In each episode, we will discuss the process of decision-making on a different topic. Rather than making recommendations, because everyone's circumstances are different, we'll talk about and we'll talk to subject matter experts about how they would recommend thinking about that decision. My name is Mike Blake, and I'm your host for today's program. I'm a director at Brady Ware & Company, a full-service accounting firm based in Dayton, Ohio, with offices in Dayton, Columbus, Ohio, Richmond, Indiana, and Alpharetta, Georgia, which is where we are recording today. Brady Ware is sponsoring this podcast. And if you like this podcast, please subscribe on your favorite podcast aggregator, and please consider leaving a review of the podcast as well. So today we're going to talk about whether to hire a chief financial officer and when to hire a chief financial officer. And this is a decision I think that any company that plans to grow to any size must wrestle with. Um, you, you can't manage a business without numbers. It just, it, it's just impossible to do that. And, and, and managing by the numbers goes a lot beyond simply debits and credits, counting beans, counting money as it comes in. In fact, on another podcast, we're talking about data analytics, and, and that is becoming part of the, the CFO's job description um, but the, the the big question, particularly for small companies, when you take that plunge, because CFOs, chief financial officers, if they're any good, they ain't cheap, and that represent and and they're not generating revenue, at least not directly. They're not selling, they're not marketing, they're not advertising. But you can't find a big or even medium sized successful company that does not have a competent CFO. At the helm, and, and as a listener, you're probably wondering. You might be wondering, uh, should I hire a CFO now? Is it something I should wait two to three years on, or did I hire a CFO too quickly? Um, did I take that plunge too quickly, and maybe I should have waited? And we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk. We're going to talk about this issue with one of the best in the business. Um, I'm delighted to have my good friend Jay Room on the program with us today. Um, you know, Jay and I have known each other for a long time, longer than either of us would probably care to admit. We know where the body, we know where each other's bodies are buried. We'll just sort of leave it at that. Um, but Jay recently retired uh, from a company here in uh, Al- Alpharetta or Johns Creek called DeNova. Where he was the chief financial officer for the past eight for the past eight years, really from startup until exit, and is currently offering financial consulting services to startups, early stage, and venture companies through his newly launched firm, JCR Financial Consulting. As CFO of DeNova, he worked closely with the founder and CEO as they took a bootstrap startup through several funding rounds of both debt and equity culminating in a $40 million equity investment by Frontier Capital, which is a North Carolina-based private equity firm in 2017. Finding the startup and venture world the most exciting environment of his career, Jay is looking to share the benefits of this experience with today's aspiring entrepreneurs. That's why he's here. Jay received his MBA from Columbia Business School in, in New York. I didn't realize that. You're smarter than I thought. That's great. He spent the formative years of his career at American Express where he rose from financial analyst to Southern Region Financial Officer of the Corporate Services Division. As financial officer, he also had financial oversight responsibilities for several other Amex businesses based in Atlanta. Jay led several major strategic initiatives, including a major pricing initiative that saved Amex $125 million of at-risk annual revenues. And and there's sort of the canned introduction. I'm going to go off the script a little bit. You know, Jay brings a, a wonderful and very unusual um, combination of technical acumen and just plain horse sense that you don't often find. And uh, maybe I'll let him tell you about the DeNova story. I like it so much I want to tell it, but that's depriving him of the opportunity. But this is a guy who's paid his dues. And there are a lot of CFOs around, but 
this is a guy who really paid his dues to get from where he started off with DeNova to now enjoying at least a semi-retirement. Um, if I build him up anymore, he'll never be able to live up to the hype like the Batman movie. So, J. Room, welcome to the podcast, my friend. It's great to have you on. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for having me. It's a delight to be here. So, um, and I'm going to start. I want. I'd like you to talk about the DeNova story because I think it 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 talks about the evolving role of the CFO. Right, that company literally went from napkin <laughs> to to something big, something that had an eight-figure exit. And you were there pretty much every step of the way. Mm -hmm. So talk about the DeNova story and your role. And I'm, I'm already jumping off the script, but we've known each other long enough. I can do that from day one, minute one. Talk about that story. It's so awesome. The world's got to hear it. I was on a, a consulting gig for a number of years in the bucket of no good deed goes unpunished. This was supposed to be a short bankruptcy, 90-day, solve a, uh, one of the first-day motion issues. And I ended up staying for four and a half years, helping the Delphi company through its bankruptcy from the day they filed until well after the emergence. So as I roll off that gig, my second phone call – the first phone call was home, of course. The second phone call was to a very, very good friend of mine named Vic Macchio. Vic uh, had this idea for DeNova. And so I call him and said, hey, I'm off. How are you doing? And he says, I've got DeNova up and running. I said, that's terrific. So I get home. I go visit him. What are you doing? He says, well, I'm, I'm trying to raise some money. This thing is going to be bigger than I am. And I said, that's a delight. I'm happy to help you. Do you have financial statements? He says, no, nah, I don't need financial statements. This is a pretty simple business model. And I said, Vic, you need financial statements. So he comes around and says, okay, um, let's get some financial statements. And he says, but I can't pay you. And I said, Vic, not a worry. I've known you 25 years at that time. That was 10 years ago. And uh, I said, it'll all work out in the end. I believe in the business. Let me help. And so we started looking to raise some funds. That's where I met my good friend, Mike Blake. Mike, you had no small role in that. With your introductions to people in the community, you were a great, great help in helping us uh, secure that funding and helping us network through the community. I think I was the ugliest cheerleader on the planet. But okay, if you want to give me the credit, I'll stop resisting it. I'm awesome. Go ahead. There you go. Um, so we, we raised a few million dollars <clears throat> and got the business up and running. Uh, and over the years, took in some small amounts of equity, but I would call that a round the primary round. And therein comes, what does a CFO do? The first thing I did was work with Vic and manage the financials so that we were cash flow positive. As quickly as we could be cash flow positive, that's key. An investor does not want to hear, I need money from an entrepreneur, I need money to make payroll. An investor right. wants to hear, I have an opportunity which I'd like to take advantage of, are you in? When, when an investor hears that I need money to make payroll, it's like in, in the, we were talking about this, the movie Airplane. By the way, does anybody know how to fly a plane? <laughs> it goes over about that well, right? So right away, early on, you could use at least some CFO to help guide the financial ship, as it were. And through the years, we maintained financial discipline uh, turned profitable in the middle of the period, somewhere around 2014, 2015, uh, and grew the business that way. I think one of the key things that a CFO does that's helpful to a business in that stage is other than the CEO, the CFO is the only other one that doesn't have a parochial view or a view from a department head. It's the one place in the company other than the CEO where an individual has a cross-company view. And that's a pretty vital role, and it's important that the CFO understand that and apply that. So when one department head says, I want to do this, 
where's the one place who's going to say, well, you need to talk to this department and that department because you're going to have impact over there? So that, that's interesting. Um, I, I'd never heard of the CFO's role being described that way. So in effect, you become the air traffic controller. In, in effect, yes. And, and it's at a peer level, too. Yeah. Uh, because the department heads and the CFO, they all report to the CEO. And um, so that's, that's key. And so you've got to be a good partner and a, a good team player. So let, let, me, let me ask this then. So um, you're brought into DeNova. DeNova, I think at that time, was not generating revenue, or if it was, it was de minimis revenue. Is that it accurate? was de minimis. That, right. that's, as I said, Vic had said, yes, I got DeNova up and running. He didn't tell me it was $12, just kidding <laughs> about the 12 bucks, But – um, it, it was small. But it was higher than zero, right? Yes, so it was more it was, than zero. It was revenue positive. Mm -hmm. So why do you think he saw wisdom in hiring a person whose job is to count money when there is no money to count yet? I, I'm not sure that that's why he brought me in. I don't think – I don't know that Vic was thinking I need financial help. Yeah, it uh, was clearly. more that – it was much more that – we had been good friends for a long time, and I offered to help for free. Got and it. when you're starting a business and you're a CEO and you're trying to get something going, you take all the free help you can get. So one of the things I'm, I'm taking away from this um, is that a CFO in many in, – at least in your case, you tell me if you think it's more common than, or, or not. But you are kind of an internal trusted advisor, Right, we mm -hmm. talk about trusted advisors from the the outside. Ostensibly, I am a trusted advisor to God knows whom, right? But you became Vic's internal trusted advisor that was captive, somebody he could who he could talk to, and you know, early on would have skin in the game by way of having a you know, modest ownership of the company and so forth. Sure, right? Yes, um, and that has maybe very little to do with finance. It, it has. You're, you're correct. It didn't, doesn't require the, the knowledge or the technical um, skills that a, that a CFO typically has. Um, but that role is vitally important. And many experienced CEOs know that when they're hiring a CFO, they are hiring a trusted advisor. And is that why you wanted to have a CFO role? I mean, the CFO role is not easy. And it's high stress. There's very high turnover in the CFO world. That that is like a it's like a baseball manager. You're almost hired to be fired. That's the nature of the gig. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to do that? Why why what was your calling to do that? I, I was lucky early in my career. I started off as an engineer and and didn't succeed very well, and so went to as we used to say in the '70s, find myself. And I found myself curled up in a ball over in a corner and picked myself up and started looking at all different kinds of things and, and found the business classes to be easy and fun. And the more I got into it, uh, the more I enjoyed the operating finance role as opposed to accounting. Um, what I like about operating finance is it's there on the front line of the business. No, as you said before, no, I'm not the one ringing the cash register. But I am the one working with the sales leader to price and what's a good deal and to coach and advise not only the CEO but all of the other department heads as to what makes good financial sense. All right. So um, now I think all, you know one of the reasons to bring in a CFO is to get the CEO out of the CFO business. Right to let yes. them do what what they do well. So, if you're at liberty to do so, we're going off script again. That's okay. Talk a little bit about about your relationship with Vic, and we know what his strengths are. What what did him hiring you enable to do enable him to do more of that made Denova successful? In in a bootstrap startup, you you have to do everything right, and. Vic was paying the bills, literally writing the checks yep. uh, and and keeping track of everything. And so I took him out of that business. I started paying the bills, keeping the books. That, that was the very, very beginning, preparing the financial statements. 
and as well as advising on business direction and strategic issues. And then that, that enabled him to do more of what? At that stage in the business and pretty much throughout, uh, his forte is, is marketing, sales and marketing. Yep. And so it really allowed him to work that much closer with the sales and, and marketing folks and build the business on that side. As Vic and I often joked, I say, Vic, you take care of the revenue. That's not my thing. You bring in the revenue. I'll take care of the expenses and the bottom line and make sure we have a healthy balance sheet. And, and as I recall, he's, he's, he's very good at raising capital too, which if you're not gen- generating revenue, you better be raising capital. You have one of those two things, mm-hmm. or it's going to be a short trip, right? So I, I think you know, him, the, the wisdom of him bringing you in as that internal trust advisor enabled him to get out of things that were not value-added from his perspective and really focus on the things that were required for DeNova to ultimately thrive, right? Yes. Right? Yes, ab- absolutely. One, one of the things that um, you mentioned raising capital is a value-add to a point. When you spend too much time raising capital, you're not focusing on the business. And one of the things I wanted to do was get Vic out of the capital raising business and raise funds when we had to, when we needed to. Um, And when I say when we had to, it wasn't to make payroll. Remember, debt, from a CFO's perspective, is a tool. If you can lever up the balance sheet from nothing, the example I use is uh, the cost of capital. If your equity costs 30 percent, then you're not going to take on a 25% return project. It's not worth it. But if you can throw a little debt on there at 5 or 10%, you bring that cost of capital down to 20%, then all of a sudden your 25% projects um, start to look pretty good. And it lets you do more. And now we're working cost of capital. Now we're, now we're talking dirty. That's good. Um, <laughs> that, that, yeah, the finance case, we're going to really geek out on this. Um, so... I think a lot of listeners don't necessarily understand the difference between a CFO and a controller. And many companies, I think, hire a controller, and they may decide that that's enough. But I'm, I wonder how many people really understand the difference between a CFO and a controller. Can you explain that that difference? Because they are different roles, and the controller typically reports to a CFO if there is one. Typically. What are, what, are, what are the what are those job? How do those job descriptions typically differ? Well, it it starts right with the skills that are brought to the table. There's a reason one can major in finance in school and one can major in accounting in school, and they are different. So it starts right with the skill set. Accounting is very technical, very important. Um, the, The financial statements are how a business communicates to its audience, its investors, And it's very, very important that the language of accounting be observed so that those financial statements mean something. That is the primary focus of a controller is not only the preparation, the debits and credits, also the controls, hence the word controller. Uh, But there are checks and balances that one needs to put in place, segregation of duties. We're really going to get into it now, Mike. Um, when when we started, we had our first audit, and I told the auditor, yes, I, I pay the bill. Um, I pay the bills, I reconcile the bank account, uh, and I prepare the financial statements. How's that for segregation of duty? And there wasn't any, but that's what it was. Um, so the controller is going to build all those processes as the company grows and prepare the company for its first audit, which, by the way, I recommend be done as early as possible. You always want to build the infrastructure ahead of the future growth. Uh, you don't want to find you've got all this money coming in and you can't control it. That's, that's a recipe for losing some. And so that's the primary focus of the controller. The CFO is a a broader job. Uh, The CFO must be fluent in accounting and all that goes along with it. But the CFO, as we've talked earlier in the show, uh, 
also has to be the internal advisor. Uh, another piece of, of the CFO job that we didn't talk about is strategic, and, and that is what's the strategic plan. Right? There's another function that many folks know is BP and FA, business planning and financial analysis. That falls under the CFO as well. Uh, and oftentimes in a growing company, the CFO is wearing many, many other hats. I had responsibility for HR. Uh, and so there's lots of things. I had a mentor once when I was at American Express, a young lad, and was working for um, an executive. And he said, hey, I've got an HR person. I have a marketing person. I have an operations person. And if it's not HR, marketing, or operations, it's finance. And so the finance is the one place that's got to pick up all the loose ends, make sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. Interesting. Okay. So, so you know, I, I've never heard the role quite that described in, 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 in quite that way. But, you know, it, it does make sense. The, of the C-level positions other than CEO, as we've talked about, it's, it's the least siloed of any of those functions, right? And, I, and I'm reading a lot about the CFO role e- even changing beyond that as, you know, the stereotypical CFO role is you're the numbers guy, mm-hmm. right? And you leave the strategy to somebody else or the job is to somehow make the finance work with that strategy or advise when the finances will not support that strategy and it must be altered. Um, but I, I'm seeing a trend where those two roles are now converging. You, you, you cannot be a, a non-strategic CFO and be, and be successful anymore in that role. Do you agree with that? Completely agree with that. Um, the, the, the benefits, one of the benefits of being at American Express early in my career is that's a very, very forward-thinking company. Uh, um, it's been a leader, what I define as a great company, is a company that's been a leader in its field, top of its game for 100 years, not 15 or 20. Because all of those companies that are leaders in their field and have been for a century are in a completely different business than they were 100 years ago. H- how did they do that, right? So does M- Microsoft may very well be a great company, and it is a great company. But their business model hasn't yet been turned completely upside down. They're growing. They're bigger. uh, But they're not in a completely different business than they were when they started. Right? Companies like – I think Procter & Gamble has one product that's 100 years old, and that's ivory soap. Is that right? I didn't know that. Yeah, ivory soap's been around a a very, very, very long time. Okay. (laughs) Um, So right there – at the operating level within Amex, there was a distinction between accounting and a business unit CFO as I was. Now, of course, if something went wrong on an audit report, it landed on my desk. But generally, I was not involved in the debits and credits. It was BP and FA, and it was an advisory role to the general manager. And so, And that was back in the late 80s. And the world has since moved much, much more in that direction. Um, And I don't mean to take anything away from my CPA brethren. Uh, They bring a whole lot to the table. And I've seen many, many CPAs who are just as strategic as any other CFO, and they make great CFOs. So, you know, I I was going to kind of ask this. Historically, there's been this dichotomy or this distinction that you either had a CFO who was a real accounting whiz or you had a CFO that really understood finance, could have conversations with bankers, venture capitalists, and so forth, set up financing schemes, and and, and you really couldn't have both in the same individual. sort of had one or the other, and you chose – that role depending on kind of how the organization shakes out and what their particular goals and needs are. Is that distinction meaningful anymore? Yes, it still is. Okay. Because as we were talking earlier, when I described the differences in the roles between uh, what a controller does and what a CFO does, they're still extremely vital 
to the company. And even a CPA, CFO, and, and I know many of those, they will also have a controller work for them so that they're not totally focused on that and they free up some time to do the advisory role and the strategic role that's required of a CFO today. Okay. So um, do you have a, a story out there where you kind of, as a CFO at DeNova, what's an example where you felt like you made the greatest impact on the company? That all comes back, in my view, ultimately to a leadership question. And it's much more about leadership than it is about necessarily technical finance. So as we were growing, it had been my approach to prepare the infrastructure for the growth so that when we had outside funding coming in and needed to deliver audited financial statements that we had the processes and procedures in place. And how would I get that done? And in leading a team, it wasn't me. I had was fortunate enough fortunate enough to have a dedicated team of professionals, great, great people who I keep in touch with, of course, who I would set the, the guiding way and said, okay, we need to, a great example is the implementation of NetSuite. We were on QuickBooks Online, just didn't meet our needs. A great product. We used it for many years, but we needed something much, much more, and I wanted online, which at the time QuickBooks didn't have. QuickBooks would have meant a server. I didn't want that. So we went with, with NetSuite, and it gave us a lot more flexibility in terms of analytics. It gave us great, great efficiencies, and that had a huge impact because – it allowed us to grow and build the finance team and structure and get all those things done while I always had my eye on what's, what's a world-class finance organization. What is it as a percentage of the expenses or the headcount? And my, my research indicated it was something less than 10%. I wanted less than 10% of the resources of the company going to the finance and the infrastructure. And so that was the target. And to do that, like I said, it comes back to the team and the leadership. And in leading a team, you set a direction, you leave your door open, and then you get the hell out of the way and, and let them go to work. So, All right. So uh, I think this is, this is drawing out a very important point because I think most – I think many <clears> – <throat> Folks, particularly if they have not hired a CFO before, we equate CFO with accounting first, finance second, ironically, but they're, in, they're, they're intertwined. Um, but what's coming out of this is, is that it's not about how much money you have to count. It's not about how complex your finances are. But do you need somebody else you, or you always need somebody else on the team who is a good leader who happens to have a skill set in those particular areas. And no firm can ever have too much leadership, right? Right. Um, it, 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 there's an old saying that, that says, and you mentioned earlier, you said uh, a CFO can be expensive. I would suggest that it's less expensive than not having one. Because th things get missed, right? And yes. people don't get led. Yes. And and when when you're in a startup position particularly, right, you can't outspend your mistakes. <laughs> that, that's, that's true. And, and I'm going to relate it back to the advisory role. Um, every small company tries to get a good board of advisors, but they're external people. And the CFO can be the internal advisor, as you pointed out earlier, uh, and and what that how that differs from the external is not only a better understanding of the nuts and bolts of the business, but it's also a frequency. How often does the CEO get to turn to somebody and ask a question? Right, you make use of the outside advisors, but on a daily basis, it's the CFO. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, it's a lonely place, right? So the CFO mm -hmm. makes it a little bit less lonely. Um, 
I'm curious, you know, I'm curious about your position on this. Um, of course, in in your position with DeNova, where you know Vic didn't have the money to pay you right off the bat, you accepted equity as part of that compensation. But even if a company has cash, do you think that ownership of the company in some fashion ought to be a requirement of the CFO? Or do you think it matters? It matters a whole lot. And my own view is that ownership of the company should be spread as far and wide inside the company as possible. Absolutely critical. What goes along with that, just giving somebody ownership of the company doesn't mean that they're always going to act in the best interest of the company. And I'm not suggesting malfeasance. What I am suggesting is a simple lack of knowledge. When you give a financial device or, or implement such as a share of stock to an HR manager who is not very skilled, is terrifically skilled in HR matters, but not in finance. They're not Warren Buffett necessarily. So what goes along with that is some level of financial knowledge has to be spread along. So in my view, just to cat recap, I think as many people as possible should have stock. And when that stock goes out, there should also be workshops and sharing of knowledge of what is finance. And as a valuation expert, Mike, you, you understand the name of the game for small companies – to get to that exit, you have to understand valuation. What makes the stock price go up? Yep. yep right? for sure. and, and it's more than just making money. So um, one, one of the roles we often associate with a CFO is to be a counterweight to the CEO. Um, that's stereotypical. Do you find that to be true? And if so... How do you manage that so that it, it doesn't – so that the, the conversations are always constructive and not yep. potentially destructive? I would say that's even desirable, Mike. Um, you, you want a yin and yang. The, the classic there, – there's no better role for a CFO than to have the classic entrepreneur as the CEO. That CEO is going to do a lot of things that the CFO just can't. They're not in the toolkit, right? Uh, and that's where the advisor and the relationship comes in. Um, there has to be healthy discussions. Um, it's not every entrepreneur can bring in a CFO that they knew for 25 years. You, you've, you're going to have to hire somebody who you previously didn't know. However, you've got to start building that relationship Im immediately, and there has to be that healthy give and take. Yeah, and you know, one thing I'll, I'll offer in, in observing how how you manage that, I don't recall a story of you ever telling Vic no, but rather responding to a decision and saying, here's what the impact is. And we've said that we've had certain goals. In your case, it was always a certain amount of cash in the account, right, a certain amount of safety. And if we do it this way, it's going to take some of that safety away. I, I would say yes to both. Yeah. I don't often retell stories of when I've told Vic no, and I'll let him tell you how many times he's heard me say no, but it's always followed up with here's why. Yeah. I would not trade away the classic entrepreneurialism that Vic brought to the table sure. for anything. It that was, was critical. Absolutely critical to the growth of the business. Um, and and so that's where our healthy discussions came in is you want to do what? <laughs> but you didn't always agree necessarily right off the bat. I mean, but you have to you have to achieve a consensus. I, I would somehow. say m most of the time we came to consensus. Um, and there were times where he would take my advice and not do something. And there were other times where he would say, nope, we're doing this and I'm pulling rank on you. And, and that it, happens. That absolutely happened. <laughs> and you know what? It didn't hurt my feelings at all. That's the NFL, right? Yep. <laughs> um, so one last question I want to ask because we're 
again, this could be a, a two-hour podcast. Um, but uh, what do you think about part-time CFOs? There are a lot of those services around, fractional CFO services. Um, is, is there a useful role for, for providers, advisors like that to play? You know, if you're not quite sure about if you want a CFO full-time, maybe you don't feel comfortable with financial commitment, or do you think you just got to rip the Band-Aid off? And just go no, on. I, I, I think there's a role for um, the fractional CFO. There, there absolutely is. Uh, what, what I would advise in a relationship with a fractional CFO is that you don't have that CFO doing the accounting. Really? T- yes. Typical, Why? Because I would want that CFO going over business plans, making forecasts understanding the business, and advising. I would have an outside CPA or a bookkeeper, right? What what many, many businesses do when they start up is get that accounting piece done. I would keep that away from the fractional CFO just so that I'm not spending my resources having the CFO doing that. And in effect, spending $250 an hour and a $60 an hour skill set. Among other things, um, right? Yes, that's a good way to describe it. And and so it, it's it. And I th- I think I've seen this too. Is that is that sometimes uh, a CFO will be hired, but then they're doing the wrong thing. They're not doing CFO things, and that's not that's not great either. Yeah, there there's a a balance that has to be struck between um where the CFO spends their time. Yep, and as you recognized right up front, we're not the ones who make the cash register ring. But I sure want to help make it ring. And if I'm preparing a financial statement, which I did in the beginning because I had to, well, when I'm doing that, I'm not out meeting a customer. Right. Okay. Um, this has been great. We we. We have all kinds of other things we could cover, but you know we, we can't cover this topic exhaustively. Um, if, if somebody wants to kind of follow up with you and ask about some of this, can they do that? Absolutely. So how, how, would, they, how would they get a hold of you? Best way to do it is through email. I'm, I'm at uh, Gmail. It's my name followed by the number one. So it's J-A-Y-R-U-H-M-1 at gmail.com. All right. Very good. Well, that's going to wrap it up for today's program. I would like to thank my good friend, Jay Room, so much for joining us and sharing his expertise with us on this this CFO issue. Um, We'll be exploring a new topic each week, so please tune in so that when you're faced with your next business decision, you have clear vision when making it. Again, if you enjoy these podcasts, please consider leaving a review with your favorite podcast aggregator. It helps people find us so that we can help them. Once again... This is Mike Blake. Our sponsor is Brady Ware & Company, and this has been the Decision Vision Podcast.